Welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. Let us help you escape your mind. All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 278 tonight, and we are joined by a special guest, Dr. Gregory Little. Uh, We have had Greg on, I don't know, a lot now, probably like five or six times. You can check out all those episodes. I have the links down below. We've done episodes on Edgar Cayce, uh, UFOs, um, Atlantis, you you name it. We've talked about it with Dr. Greg. Uh, and also you can check out all of his books. I have the links down below. Uh, he's, I mean, how many books have you written now? Uh, well, okay. So it's 30, 32, what you'd call nonfiction kind of books and textbooks, and then 40 some treatment books. Okay. Treatment oriented books. Yeah. Treatment for various, uh, mental health issues. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, he does freedom to change that's on there. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, I think probably in terms of his nonfiction, uh, his best is the, uh, the encyclopedia book of mounds, which, um, is a very dense, but very <laughs> worth it purchase. If you are into the native American mound stuff and, uh, ancient mounds and all that, I, I highly recommend it. Um, as well as his two newer books, which we've had him on and Andrew on, um, in the last couple of years, we've talked about Denise of an Origins and then their newer one, Origins of the Gods, which we talked about, I think, last time uh, we discussed, you know, your part, which had a lot of Carl Jung, plasmoids, um, that whole kind of a thing going on, which I really enjoyed. <clears throat> but yeah, so that's, um, we'll, we'll be riffing on some of all that tonight, as well as some other things. Um, and Dr. Greg is actually in our documentary. He is the second person featured. Um, if you have not checked out our documentary already, uh, the link is down below. We are, we put it on our Patreon. We're still editing a little bit more. We're going to try and get it out to more people at some point here in the future. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we have it on our Patreon for seven seventy seven, which I think is a fair price given the amount of time that we put on it. Um, but yeah, Dr. Greg's in there sharing his knowledge on plasmas, and uh, we're going to talk about that tonight because Shane had a synchronicity with that whole thing, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, we're 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 going to hit it. We're back at it now. Um, you know, my time was obviously spent doing the documentary stuff and all that, but we're we're pivoting back to doing normal Mind Escape episode stuff. So. Um, looking forward to it. We have some amazing guests starting tonight. We have Dr. Greg back on and, uh, yeah, we're just going to roll with it. Shout out to Toby. Um, and we're going to start rolling with our other podcast again too, the Roswell UFO symposium. Maybe we can get Dr. Greg on there to talk aliens, uh, specifically, but, um, yeah, let's, let's hit it. Um, so I, I like the I like the way you said normal mind escape. <laughs> <laughs> you said we're going to do some normal mind escape. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I we get weird. A lot of your shows. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I appreciate it. No, I I look. Um, we we, I believe there's more to life than what meets the eye, but I also think there's a lot of bullshit out there too. So it's kind of wading through all that stuff to kind of find those morsels of truth, you know, and I feel like a kinship to you with that, uh, um, and, and the work that you've done and everything. So, uh, yeah. Um, last time you were on, we talked about your book origins of the gods. Do you have anything currently that you're working on or something that you have coming out soon? Well, I do have, I've been, I've been working on the uh, third edition of that mound encyclopedia now. Uh, and it's just, it's just an, it was an overwhelming project to begin with. I think I told you the story of how it started through dreams. Um, I don't think I ever told you the story about what happened when I decided I wasn't going to do that. Maybe we'll get to that in here because it goes back to dreams, but yes, I, on, on Twitter, I know, you know, I'm on Twitter. That's how we communicate a lot. And one of the things that has happened 
is that uh, so many people are asking me questions like, where are mounds? Where can I go? I live in this place or that place, and I want to I want to spend a few days looking at these. And they just don't know where they are. There's you can look it up on the internet, of course. You can look up sites, but they don't always tell you where they are. Nor do they tell you the uh, the details. Like, is it private? Can you actually go to it? Can you even see it? Uh, so I have been working on a series of books on guides to various mounds. Uh, and the guides are like, okay, a five day trip where you can take a loop. Uh, you can spend five days. And the first one that I've done, it's done. We're not going to release it till we have several more ready because it's going to be a series. But, uh, over that five days in this one, it's very inexpensive to drive it. Uh, uh, I've chosen even motels, found places for people to stay places along the routes where there's uh, electric vehicle charging. Uh, Cause in five, in five, six years, a lot of people are going to be using electric vehicles a lot more than now. Uh, so that is what I've been working on. Um, and so like in, in the first one, you could see roughly 60 mounds over five days in a fairly easy, leisurely driving loop. Uh, so that's the idea with all of them come up with a three to five day tour. So that's what I'm working on. Uh, and like I say, it'll be out when we get the third one, probably later this year. Uh, they they go pretty quickly, but that's what I'm doing right now. That's awesome. I know Shane and I were talking about, he's from Southern Illinois. I live in oh, Chicago yeah. now. We were talking about maybe meeting up and going to the Cahokia. Cahokia. Mountains. Yeah. Cahokia is a good one to start at. They've closed the museum by the way, uh, for a year. It won't be open for another year. And a lot of other sites, uh, One another good example is Etowah, Georgia. They've closed the museum there for a year. And in the past months, something has happened, which I've talked about on your show before. There was a law passed uh, in 1889, 1989 and 1990. One of the laws applied only to the Smithsonian the other one applied to all museums that are considered public, which the law said a public museum is one that has ever received a single federal dollar in support. So if, if a museum got a $1 from the federal government, they had to file the law. And the law was called NAGPRA, N-A-G-P-R-A, stands for Native American Grave, uh, yeah, Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act which meant all burial items and skeletal remains that were dug from mounds or Native American sites in the country had to be returned or repatriated to the tribes that were in that region. And then they would either rebury them. In some cases, the tribes have actually cremated the remains. And in some cases, I believe they've put them in their, put some of the artifacts in their own museums. So that is what's happening uh, at Etowah. Uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority has been named in this. They have over 100,000 different artifacts and an unknown number of skeletons. It numbers in the thousands, which have been in warehouses in storage since the 1930s when they, along with the old Works Progress Administration, dug into, I would say it's over 100 mounds, uh, probably 200, 300 sites uh, throughout the Tennessee River Valley when the Tennessee Valley Authority was building dams. So they went in, they excavated all these mounds, pulled all this stuff out, and rather than actually doing much with it, they took the best artifacts and they gave them to some museums and universities, but everything else they boxed up and they shipped to a warehouse where it has been since the 1930s. So that has come out in newspapers. Uh, they, a lot of them were even shocked they had all this, but the Smithsonian has popped up in it. University of California uh, is one, the top 10, they're one of them. Lots of lots of major universities simply have not complied with the NAGPRA Act, and suddenly it's become an issue. So that's something that's going on. So a lot of the museums are temporarily closed while they 
decide what to do. Some of them have put a lot of replicas out uh, instead of the originals. Um, so I don't know what I don't know what will happen with that. But of course, you know, I post a lot of uh, pictures of the replica, uh, not the replicas, but the original stuff on on Twitter from time. Well, pretty much every day. So uh, that's one thing that's going on. Um, and I know we really got into um, what they were doing with their rituals related to mounds. And I th- and uh, maybe linking all that to UFOs. But you ask what I was doing. That's it. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. We In the past, actually, if anybody's interested, I have the links to our previous episodes uh, with, with them in, in the past below. We did one where it was a lot of the Native American mounds, or at least the more famous ones in America. Uh, he put a slideshow, Dr. Greg put a slideshow together. It was, um, I thought it was a great informational, educational episode. Um, so if you're interested, you can check that out. We've also done a few Patreons with them on our Patreon page. So if you watch the documentary, also check out those episodes and those other segments we did because there's some real gems in there. I know one of them, uh, Dr. Greg walks us through the... Uh, Native American metaphysics and their origin stories in some cases and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I think we talked about that hand, um, the symbol with the the eye and the hand. Yeah, the Ogi or Ogi or however you pronounce it. Yeah, Ogi. Yeah, the eye and hand was uh, their symbol. It's a lot of people keep saying it's a hamsa. It's a hamsa, which is the, the, the hand and then there's an eye in it. Uh, it is an ancient symbol from India. It is found all over the world. But the eye and hand symbol with Native Americans is is quite different. Uh, it is shown up and it's shown down. It depends on the time of the season and the night, uh, the time at night, because it is the it is a constellation in the sky, and it's the constellation of Orion. The three belt stars of Orion are attached to the wrist of a severed hand and Orion's nebula, which is known as Messier 42, uh, is the eye and it is an Ogi. Uh, and I know you, you had on PD Newman a few, uh, maybe about a month ago, I think. Uh, and you were discussing, uh, the use of uh, various hallucinogenic drugs with native Americans and so on. And I know he mentioned that the, the, the Ogi, in Orion, is it's a portal, but it's one that the soul would tuck into, like a shell, like the inside of a shell, which he, he explained it in a really good way. And so the whole point of that was a, de- a soul from a dead person would ascend to the sky, tuck away in this, and then uh, it, it's doing it right when Orion is setting into the Western horizon, right before the sun comes up. And they knew what happened. It would sink down, go under the earth and around, and it came up on the Eastern horizon the next night because it made an apparent movement from the Eastern horizon to the West. Well, the soul was traversing the underworld during that. So it was safely tucked away in Orion's nebula going through the underworld. When it came up the next night, it was near the Milky Way itself. Orion is close to it. And the soul would hop to the Milky Way and then it would traverse to the north to get to the final portal out of the sky, which is probably the star Deneb, which is the brightest star of the Cygnus constellation, also known as the Northern Cross. Lots of iconography in Native American uh, that symbol is found all over the place in Native American pottery, uh, in lots of other objects that they made, and it, it's just everywhere. And a lot of mound sites are aligned to it. So in, in this discussion, UFOs and entities, uh, the, the use of hallucinogenic drugs fits into this and what is being perceived under the influence of hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, And it's their version of what a lot of modern people might do, doing one of two things. Uh, Some people try to voluntarily kind of commune or link to whatever 
uh, the spiritual forces are, depends whatever you want to call them. Uh, the Native Americans did it through various rituals. And then, yes, some of them did. In fact, they used various hallucinogenic drugs, very similar to ayahuasca. In fact, uh, I hate I hate bringing this up because I don't want to I do not want to encourage people to go out and try to dig up substances and plants around the place and then test it on themselves because some of this stuff is very dangerous because uh, you have to mix like the 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 plants that have ayahuasca in them you have to mix it with datura or jimson weed uh, and some other things to make it active and yeah, that's Brumancia. yeah that that yeah, um, he, yeah that's said uh, no that's from people that I know that do ayahuasca a lot or DMT a lot that have done that the uh, more traditional way, which they add like a yeah. little bit of um, detura or tropanes in it. It it, yeah. it it becomes not as biologically safe anymore as just the DMT molecule or just the yeah. psilocybin or whatever, you know, the other tryptamines. Well, you can kill yourself doing this stuff. So you have to be very, very cautious. And I don't, I don't want to encourage anybody to do it. And when I said there's a couple ways to do it, another way is through rituals that don't involve drugs. And the Native Americans were really good at that. And that's by drumming, constant drumming. You pretty much have to exhaust yourself physically and mentally. They did it in several ways. Uh, some would actually go to a mountain a mountaintop in the middle of winter and expose themselves to the elements for three or four straight days. Uh, and the only thing they would do is sometimes drink water. Not everybody even drank water. But if you do, if you do that, chances are you will have a, an experience. Uh, and that experience, some people see as spiritual. They, they generally report seeing entities or beings that are pretty much identical to the traditional UFO experience. So that is one that one way, voluntarily doing it. Some people do it um, experimentally. What well, makes uh, you wonder too? What's the what's happening endogenously um, during those experiences? Obviously, that you know we're we have a, a ton of different hormones and chemicals and stuff coursing through our veins. Um, there's what? two ideas. Yeah, there's two two possibilities. Yeah. One is the, you know, you talk to mainstream psychology, mainstream psychiatry, uh, and of course all the skeptics. Oh, uh, you're hallucinating. And hallucinations by definition are your uh, visual hallucinations. You are seeing something that is not exactly real. That's what it is. You might be seeing an object, but the object is moving, you know, and swirling around, whatever. But it's not real. That's the main thing. You're hallucinating or you're hearing things that aren't really there. So your brain is making them up. That's the traditional idea. And that's what most mainstream psychologists would say. That's what's in the textbooks, most of the textbooks, too. The other idea, though, which is one that I'm beginning to really accept and and close to really supporting is that what is happening in in the brain is that it is changing our reception our receptors in the eyes in the ears all the brain all of the brain neurons are receptive to other electromagnetic fields and to explain this i have to talk about uh antennas we are a biological antenna in our eyes in the back of our eyes is the retina the retina consists of millions of cells which have a point of the cell sticking out they're exposed in the back of the eyes in the retina there's two types one is called rods the other is called cones uh, the cones see color and the rods see black and white but when i see when i say they see that what it means is the rods, which only see black and white, are bringing in or receiving as antennas. They're receiving a very, very narrow frequency in the electromagnetic energy spectrum. And the cones are receiving a little wider frequency in the electromagnetic energy spectrum. So what we, what we see as visible light comprises roughly 4.7%. I know that sounds 
specific, but it's not. I could go to, you know, there's more decimals. But we see roughly 4.7% of the electromagnetic energy spectrum. And what that means is, is that over 95% of the EM spectrum, we don't see. It consists of ultraviolet, infrared, and you go to cosmic rays, you go to, to radio frequencies, cell phone, TV frequencies, and so on. Carl Jung, back in the 1960s, said that he believed that the true UFO ab not, abductions didn't really exist in, uh, when R Jung wrote that book in 1959. It came out in 61, but in 59 he wrote it. Abductions didn't exist, but there were contactee experiences where people said that an alien came to them. Sometimes they saw an orb of light. Sometimes it was a globe that came down. Other times it was a flying saucer and an alien would walk out you know, and talk to them. Uh, and then the alien left, they always left. So Jung said that what he thought was going on was a psychoid process. The word psychoid means that it is an archetype an archetype, which needs explanation too, but it's an archetype that is bridging the re bridging itself from the unseen portion of the electromagnetic energy spectrum into the visible portion. And it does that by literally altering its, its frequency, which is how radio waves work. When you're tuning a dial on a radio, which I guess a lot of people don't do that anymore, but when you're doing that, what you're doing, you are changing the actual frequency that your radio receives. And that's what our eyes do. So to get back to your original point, I think that, or your question, I think that what is going on is that we may well be uh, receptive to different electromagnetic energy spectrum frequencies and of course, as I've already said, as I said in prior shows, I think that plasmas, which are balls of highly ionized energy, uh, plasmas put out an electromagnetic energy field, and we are literally communing or interacting with them. They become visible and they are communicating with us because our reception of that frequency has altered and i think that's what some of these drugs do i know i went a long way no no there i mean that makes a lot of sense it makes a lot of sense i mean you saw i can't prove it i can no. i can't prove it i mean i'm no on that yet. i'm on that train myself i mean people have been watching our podcast for the five, last five years know that one of my main hypotheses or hypotheses that all metaphysics comes from altered states of consciousness, meaning yeah. in day-to-day -day consciousness, you do not interact with anything that would make you go investigating some of the, f the fringes and edges of our perception. But when you have a lucid dream or you meditate or psychoactive compounds or whatever the case may be, it, 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 it puts you into a different state of mind in which you realize, oh, whatever I'm experiencing in my day-to-day -day consciousness can't, can't be all there is because I mean, I, I personally, and I had, this was probably the last time I did it, but the last real psychedelic experience I had a few years ago, that was like groundbreaking. Um, I thought to myself, how does everybody not see this? And what I kept thinking is we, I don't know how to explain this in a way that would make sense, but the idea that this is all there is and then we die doesn't make sense when you're in that state. For whatever reason, it doesn't allow you to think like that. Like, oh, they don't know. Like, you just keep thinking, like, they can't see this. They don't understand this. But this is what this, this is what this is. And it's not, it's like a not, it's non dualistic, but it's also, you understand self too. It's hard to explain. I don't know. I'll go through that. I'll yeah. try to unpack that in, in another episode, but basically hey. in, in an altered state, you can recognize the fact that like your hand is part of your body, even though you feel like it's separate. That's how you feel about life and death when you're in those states, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Shame. I was, like was, was going to yeah. mention that as you're talking, I'm sitting there listening and I'm like, this sounds almost similar to what like Keel talks about in the eighth tower on the super spectrum and 
ultra terrestrials and some fort with his enchantment. Don't trust what you're seeing because again, like you said, your mind can be manipulated on the spectrum, right? You know, you could see whatever they want. So I'm just sitting there listening. I'm like, this I finally understand. As you're talking about it before, I'm just trying to listen and learn. But this I understand. That's cool stuff. Well, Keel, Keel said the same thing. I've I've written this several times. Keel and Carl Jung were on the same page. Now, Keel came after Carl Jung, and I doubt that Keel really read Jung's book. He came up with it on his own. And Keel Keel called them, of course, ultra terrestrials, which didn't mean they came from off world. I don't believe the the vast majority of UFO reports, alien abductions, uh, alien interactions, all this stuff. I think that we're interacting with something that's already on Earth, and that's what Keel said too. But it's when I say it's on Earth, people think it's like a physical object they can go touch, and the problem is sometimes it probably is a physical object because it lives on the. I shouldn't even say the word "lives" because that confuses people. It exists on the edge of what we would call physical reality. It's like right on the edge. And it can be physical for a period of time or appear physical, but then it can dissipate instantly. And yes, uh, John Keel said that it was the electromagnetic energy spectrum. The whole idea of us being an antenna, a biological antenna, the first place I ever read it was in John Keel's book. I think the eighth tower was the second one that he did that had that exact idea that we are biological antennas. Um, I was also going to ask you some of it. I mean, Earthlight theory. What do you think about that in, in all of this? Well, I've seen as far some as like the plasmas and things like yeah. that. I think that legitimate Earthlights are plasmas. Um, uh, there's been a lot of research on them. Uh, there are different kinds of plasmas. Uh, I think ball lightning is also plasmas. But the research pretty much shows us that plasmas form. Uh, in a couple ways, other than being formed in a laboratory uh, in experimentation. But they form naturally, and they form through one way is tectonic pressure, which means when two tectonic plates or something underground where you have a fault line where it's pushing, and the push, the, the pressure, it's like squeezing a crystal. If you take a crystal and you squeeze it, you're generating electricity. It won't be enough necessarily for you to feel, but if you actually crush that crystal in the dark, you'll see light flying out of it. Uh, That's an experiment I tell people to try all the time. Do an experiment in your bathroom. Uh, I think I've said that on your show before and talked about that. Is that right, Maurice? Well, Maurice says the night off. Uh, Yeah, I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, you're good. You're good. No, yeah, we're. I talked about that once, didn't I? Yeah, you did. You you absolutely did. Can I say one more thing? Sure. For me, he mentioned it earlier. My mic wasn't working, right? But the synchronicities of, I actually listened to you talk about the balls of plasma, the portal in Yakima Valley, after I'd already put my story and the videos of the same exact thing in Yakima Valley to him. And I was like, wait, what? did you know this and it and it just blew because actually between you and there was the book the earthlight theories that i kind of started finding my research into most of this stuff in yakima valley and the yakima nation all these different things that the in the mounds all this stuff that keeps showing up with you're one of the reasons i just thought it was synchronicitous that i ended up in the same documentary like right there and i'm yeah. like he's talking about the same thing i'm seeing <laughs> So when when were you at Yakima? When did and did you I'm see still the here. Oh, okay. I've You're been there. seeing him. Well, I'm funny story. So since 2020, I still am. Okay. Lots of plasma. Lots of recording. He, li- he lives right there. Where do you live, Shane? I live I live in Prosser area, okay. so Yakima Valley area, right near Hanford. But lots okay. of the basically the the orb is plasma stuff all the right. time. Well, I spent, and I couldn't figure I, it out for a long time. I recorded a lot of it. It's, it's in the dock oh, and stuff cool. like that. So, All right. I spent uh, four or five nights on the uh, Yakima Reservation uh, right at Toppenish Ridge, right at the base of Toppenish Ridge where a lot of the stuff went on. Uh, and I, I had um, 
because you weren't supposed to do that anymore, you know, they have, have closed that off. I had Washington state government officials go with me. Uh, we weren't bothered by anyone, uh, but these were sort of higher ups and they were, in, I was employed by them doing some uh, contract work uh, and they were very interested in it. We didn't see anything at night, which is quite strange. We spent several whole nights there. But in the daytime when we went, I wanted to take a whole bunch of pictures. So I did. I took a bunch of pictures. And this was like 1993, 94, uh, and 95. I spent a lot of time in Washington State uh, and about three weeks or so in Yakima over time. Uh, and the pictures that I took, of course, in those days, we had film. We didn't have digital cameras. So I took all the pictures of Toppenish Ridge where you can see 100 fault lines running up and down that ridge and had them developed when I got home in Memphis. And lo and behold, in the sky, one of the things that I saw that was just shocking was a smoke ring, a giant, perfect circular smoke ring. And there was just nothing there, no reason for that, way up in the sky. Uh, had no idea what it was. And then on these pictures, there was a big series of odd blobs that were like translucent. I took a lot of pictures in Washington state. They were the only ones that had these odd translucent blobs. Some of them were whitish and almost round. Some of them were oblong uh, and they weren't, they weren't developing errors because I took it in. And that is when I came to the conclusion that the plasmas are, all these things are also there in the daytime. We just can't see them because it's light and they're translucent. And most people aren't looking up and staring. And I suspect that my camera picked up more of the light spectrum that I can see. That's what I, that's what I think. How do you think so, you would detect something like that during the day? Like throw up some sort of um, radar or satellite, something to like ping off a of dust, it? Or? A dusty plasma you would pick up on radar. You know, yeah. we talked about that before too. I think the, the yeah, you dusty, mentioned that from the Project Condine or whatever. Yeah, that's in Project Condine, and it's it's also been talked about in a lot of the uh, Navy, uh, the Navy patents for their devices that where they use plasmas, plasmas based technology. Uh, but the dusty plasmas are definitely picked up on radar. But how you detect it beyond that, a normal person can't doesn't have access to the kind of radar that's going to be able to pick it up. Uh, I don't know. I know that uh, Wilhelm Relk, I mean, you've had, uh, right, sorry, you had Andrew Collins on your show before. And one of Andrew's earliest books was one where he was following up on some of Wilhelm Reich's research with his cloud buster trying to pull in what he called organ energy, which that was a weird name, I think, for what he perceived was plasmas. I think that's that's what Reich was trying to do. Uh, I don't really know if his device, I've heard people say his devices worked really well. Uh, that's one of the things we never experimented on in the psych labs when I was a graduate student. And I think I've talked about that. We did lots of experiments and all kinds of weird things. Uh, but we never tried that, although we did talk about it at the time. But I don't think we had the equipment and technology to build something there. Uh, but I think it could be done. Uh, I'm not really sure how. Uh, but but the, the ones I'm more interested in are the ones that interact with us. Uh, the, the ones in the sky, I believe, I know from both the Yakima research and similar research that was done in southeastern Missouri uh, in the 1980s uh, by the uh, chairperson of the Department of Physics there, Harley Rutledge, uh, he said that the plasmas that they found and the researchers, Greg Long was out in Yakima, that those plasmas knew that they were being observed and they interacted with the scientists so that's a clue we should here. talk even, more later then yeah well even yeah, modern that's, that's how mine are they interact that's they interact that's why I, yes well that's, that's that book you, were, you showed me on. shane that greg long guy because he initially when yeah, i said greg Earthlight little he, he got him confused with you uh, yeah, but I got him confused. it's got yeah. um earth light theory yakima valley um and it talks about those but whatever i see interacts to the point that like I'll step outside my back porch multiple days in a row and get a recording of it just kind of hovering and then taking off. 
waiting for me mm-hmm. to get a film and then going or just kind of random stuff like that. Or I yeah. go to get marijuana at the weed <laughs> store. Tara, <laughs> there it is. And there it is. Uh-huh. It's going. You can just get, like uh, that, right? you can and see his good. videos on his Twitter got, timeline. So, and he's also actually, we yeah. used like three or four of them in the documentary. And I've too. got like 60 oh. or 70 that I've never even put out a look through. I see record this stuff so much over here. I thought it was Hanford for a long time. Then I realized Yakima Valley is a hot spot. It is, and it's, it still is. There's a there is a physicist that is still doing work there. His name will pop in my head. I interacted with him in 2009, uh, and I did know Greg Long way back when, uh, and I was actively into the UFO stuff then. Uh, I never got to meet Hartley, Harley Rutledge, but I did spend more time in southeastern Missouri and talk to loads and loads of the people there who not only saw the the UFOs, the lights in the sky, but some of them interacted with them. Uh, and these plasmas, they're not all just little orbs. When it's when this stuff is really going on, when it's at its peak, they take on disc-like shapes. They have multi-colors that appear on the sides, which look like portholes. They can shoot light out of them. And the light, I believe, you know, they talk about how, you know, a brilliant beam of light comes down and shines on the ground. I think what's happening there, it is an interaction of energy. I think energy is moving back and forth at that point. That's why it's shining on the ground. I know at Yakima, some of the early reports, and particularly the people that lived at the base of Toppenish Ridge, and they were all natives at the time, they said they could actually see these balls of light, and I, I kind of think of them like a giant water balloon or something, the way they describe them, like these balls of light would be tumbling down this mountain very slowly, and that they would be following the fault lines. And when they got really close to the bottom and close enough to where these people could interact with the electromagnetic field, they would see that inside of these whatever they are, I think they're plasmas, they could see beings, beings forming, and the beings would interact with them. Sometimes it was Bigfoot. During the the early Yakima research, there were like 25 different reports of Bigfoot. A number of the farmers, uh, below Toppenish Ridge is a flat area that had an orchard, at least there was in the 90s when I was there. Uh, It was an orchard. And so they would be out there doing some work at night on on tractors. And several of the Native Americans that were there of the Yakima tribe said that when these balls of light came down the mountain and came over the tractors, it caused electrical discharges, that they could feel the electricity sort of coming off of them and that they had problems with the tractor. And some people driving by at the time reported the same thing, including like the the smell of sulfur. Uh, and a lot of them then heard very strange noises. They sounded like animal noises. And that is when they would begin seeing the beings. So it's a very strange Isn't that thing. sulfur smell? That's what, from that moment of contact, James Fox documentary, when that thing that crashed, they said that it there. smelled like it smelled like sulfur or something. Yeah. That's why Keel Lock also eggs. thinks that paranormal and all that's related, that smell. Yeah. Well, I think it is too. Actually, I think it's when the uh, electromagnetic field, uh, when it reaches a certain strength and a certain frequency, I think it literally causes a burning, an ionization of something, and that's what causes the sulfur smell. That's, I mean, I believe that science can figure all this out, figure yeah. out what it is, but I don't think science will ever be able to dig into it because I think it has intelligence. It is, it is what it is. It has its own intentions, its own existence. Uh, it's, it's not alive in the same sense as we feel alive, but I think that it has all of the characteristics of life. And that's what the physicists tell you. I've explained that on several of your shows about in 2007, a group of seven physicists published an article on plasma research they had done in the laboratory. And they said plasmas have all of the characteristics of life, including DNA. And the DNA allows them to replicate 
including evolution because the weaker plasmas die off and their energy goes to the stronger plasmas and that they they duplicate literally that would explain when you see it the big one like a big ball of light and suddenly two or three others come out of it it's almost like cell duplication and the word plasma come was was applied to it because it had the same characteristics of blood cells blood plasma that's why they called it plasma interesting um so you mentioned so we were talking about um yakima valley and then you said i think in the documentary you mentioned the missouri one is that piedmont yes the piedmont area that's okay so, so piedmont, but it's are all those... the way from, from central missouri in the in the whole southeastern quadrant of missouri is where this went on the whole southeastern quad all the way so are those the two biggest like plasma hot spots that we know of so far probably not uh there are some mountains that have it uh several mount shasta or something well yeah uh of course there's heseldine uh those lights you're familiar with those i assume okay uh, and there are other places, Brown Mountain, uh, North Carolina. We've spent a, I've spent a lot of time in Brown Mountain, took a lot of film there. <clears throat> I believe that that's pl- probably plasma based. The only people that have ever gotten close to it, to the lights, and there's several reports of it, felt what they said felt like an electrical discharge. And I think it, it was an electromagnetic field that they entered. Uh, some of them passed out when they got too close of it to it. Others had weird experiences. And of course, the Native American legends in that area, it's, it's close to Asheville, by the way, where Brown Mountain is. Uh, the Native American legends say that they interacted with it and that it had been around for all time. So those are various places. I don't think a whole lot is being reported in Missouri right now. The reason I spent so much time there is because uh, that's where my wife is from. Uh, her father was a 28 year uh, elected, essentially district attorney there. So I got access to a lot of people. Her brother was the adjutant general of the Missouri National Guard. So I got some access there and found out a whole bunch of information on when this, when the research was being conducted by Southeastern State Missouri, uh, the university there, they were trying to find out why there were so many military jets and helicopters that would often be seen when they were out in the field finding these plasmas, videoing them, photographing them, and and, and trying to measure them. Um, And, of course, the Missouri National Guard told them, uh, we don't have any idea what's going on. We don't know what it is. Uh, And I found out later that what they were doing is they would pick up things on radar and send out uh, jets if they could or helicopters other time, other times if they were close enough to try and see what it was because they were also low to the ground. Uh, And they never found anything that they could do anything about. Uh, So there were so many reports in Missouri, literally hundreds and hundreds of reports. Uh, J. Allen Hynek came in, was there for half a day, was it, looked at one photograph. Uh, he did, and he just said, oh, it's a lens flare, and he left. That's all he did there. Uh, but other people did spend a great deal of time doing the research. Uh, there were several UFO organizations that came in and interviewed over 800 witnesses. Uh, later, when I started looking into it, and it was after... It was in the 80s when I started this research, around 84. I talked to some people that had missing time. I talked to some of the people who had seen the the disc-shaped saucers with the portholes and the alternating lights on the sides. And they were driving at night, generally on Friday nights, from basketball games. That's when most of this stuff was sighted because these are very remote areas. They're farm towns mainly. So they're some distance apart. And so they'd have a basketball game. One town would have a basketball game in another. And then all the whole, half the town would drive back uh, home after it and go through all these remote farmer's fields. And that's where most of this stuff took place. Well, I talked to some people that had witnessed it 
Uh, the stories are absolutely bizarre. They all tell the same stories. Uh, the cars were filled with five or six people. They would have eight to 10 car loads of people. Uh, I didn't talk to all eight to 10 car loads of people, but I probably talked to 20 that, that saw these and they all reported the same thing. None of them said that it was alien. They didn't know what it was. A lot of them thought that has to be military. One of the things that they said was that one of the weirdest stories was a group of five in a vehicle saw this object in a, at the far end of a farmer's field next to a tree row. Now, in almost all these fields there, the property lines are marked with a tree line. There's a narrow tree line uh, and often there's a fence, but usually it's just a tree line to mark it. So there was a large, like a cylindrical shaped object that had rotating lights going around it. Uh, and this group of five stopped their vehicle coming from a basketball game in Dexter heading back to New Madrid, uh, New Madrid, Missouri. And they stopped, got out and watched this thing. And the lights were rotating and they said it lifted up above the trees and turned around, rotated. And then they said this ball of fire shot out the back, what they thought was a ball, ball of fire. And then it just doom, took off. That was there. That's what they saw. So there were several reports of that by Harley Rutledge, but most of what Rutledge got, the, the chairman of the Department of Physics, what he got were reports of, of strange lights. And when people got close to the lights, they would see entities or other strange things. Some, there is a report of the basketball coach, uh, at, um, I can't remember the name of the school now, but a very well-respected basketball coach, his wife and a radio station owner and his wife, uh, they were driving from a late night party, like at 1 AM. And in the middle of the road, there's a famous picture of this. That's in a lot of UFO books in the middle of the road, what they saw a light ahead, but then standing in front of the light was this creature that appeared to be in like a scuba, scuba gear, just standing in the middle of the road. And they stopped. They, and when I say that, it had on like a scuba outfit, had on a skin tight outfit. Uh, they couldn't distinguish if, if it had fingers on its hands or anything. And it had on some sort of helmet uh, and something weird on its back. And that the only thing that they could s describe it was that it's kind of like a scuba outfit that it had on. Uh, and it turned around, got in the object and disappeared. Uh, and at first they swore themselves to secrecy, but then there were just so many of these reports. Uh, and this guy got interviewed so many times. He finally told the story. I interviewed, uh, a bank president and a school teacher, uh, in a town along the Mississippi river. And this was some years after the event, they were going to a, they were going home from a small event, uh, in another town, uh, and on their way home, again, these very rural areas, you can drive for miles at night. You won't see another car. Uh, and they stopped when they saw this gigantic saucer thing with a black bottom. It was solid black and it was a clear night. And what they knew it was solid black because when it passed over their car, they bought, they had gotten out for a minute and looked up and it just, it blotted out the stars. And when it got over them, they could see like the stars around the edges of it, but they said it was just gigantic. It made no sound whatsoever, no sound whatsoever. And then it just silently kind of floated and moved over the Mississippi River on over into what is Illinois over there or northern, the, the northern edge of Tennessee where it hits part of Illinois. Uh, or, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, Kentucky. It's Kentucky there. So let me ask lots you, of stories like that. Yeah. Let me ask you a question as uh, somebody that studied the mind and psychology and all that. So, like, making the documentary... Um, I proposed this question, you know, at the beginning, is this um, some sort of evolutionary mechanism where human beings 
uh, create a mystery and then solve a mystery. And through that process, it evolves our consciousness or pushes us further, blah, 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 blah. I say that that's at very least what this is. Uh, but at very most, it could be something completely weird or strange that we can't even fathom. Now, most scientifically minded people or dogmatic materialists would say these are all hallucinations or misinterpretations or whatever. But from making the documentary and doing the show the last five years, we're talking millions of people over thousands of years that have seen weird things that can't be explained. So is it that our senses are just really that flawed? Like, uh, you know, um, just I don't some think sort they're flawed. It's not we're flawed. in some sort of Parmenides prism or, or prison or something like that. Or is or or we're just like I said, like something far more strange beyond the scope of our current scientific paradigm. Hence, you said everything could be explained by science. We're just not there yet. I actually agree with that. That's actually just what metaphysics is, is the stuff that's yeah. beyond the current scope of understanding. Um, but yeah, I mean, so what do you think is going on there? Do you think it's a possibility that our mind has some sort of mind virus? Or do you think no. that, and I'm not saying I believe that, but I'm just curious because that's what a lot of people that would dismiss all of this stuff would say. All right, so number one, uh, if we could see all that stuff all the time, we wouldn't be able to function. We couldn't survive. Uh, it, it, literally, if we could see everything in the electromagnetic energy spectrum, we wouldn't be able to move around. We'd bang into everything because we couldn't see anything, particularly now because there's, geez, we're, we're in the middle of an electromagnetic energy cesspool. It's all over. Wi-Fi, electric wires, uh, cell phones, everything. They're, they're all over. So, but even without that, we're being bathed in electromagnetic energy all the time. The earth produces its own. It's called the Schumann resonance. Uh, it produces its own. So all we would be able to see, if we saw the entire electromagnetic energy spectrum, we would see cosmic rays flying through. Actually, you can see cosmic rays from time to time. If you're in a completely darkened atmosphere, I don't know if you know this, if you're in a totally, completely darkened atmosphere, it has to be totally, completely dark, and just lay there for a while, eventually you'll see what looks like a little burst of light. And it's believed that those are cosmic rays passing through our eyes because that's what they do. Cosmic rays go right through us. <laughs> that's actually, wow. I'll talk to you at, uh, offline, but that's actually kind of interesting. Uh, I have a question right, from but, our audience, okay. actually. Someone wants to know if you can talk about Legend Rock and uh, Medicine Wheel in Wyoming. Uh, I'll talk about Medicine Wheel in a minute. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, I do want I do want to answer this though. So no, I don't think I don't think our senses are flawed. I think that what what we are dealing with here is a the best way to say it. It's a different kind of intelligent life form. It's here. It's with us. We coexist with it. It interacts with us. What we're doing is it's it's interacting with us. And over the eons, its interaction with us is simply adjusting because in an inner an interaction isn't like i mean we adjust each other you ask me a question and i'll adjust what i'm going to talk about and, and i might i might influence you and you'll say oh yeah that brings up this so We're do you think so do you think That's through evo uh, evolution we've learned to attenuate whatever's coming in to suit whatever we need is basically just through like you're talking about just to survive. So like we don't need to see those cosmic rays. We don't need to see infrared or anything like that. It's not that we don't need to. We couldn't survive with it. You wouldn't be able to gather food. You wouldn't mm. be able to hunt. You wouldn't see anything. All you'd see is a sea of, of moving colored light in front of you all the time. That's why. You'd see it all. You'd see every If, if uh, you know, I wouldn't mind having... Uh, uh, some infrared. I'd love to be able to see a bit of infrared because, you know, it's like having an infrared scope. You can see at night. Uh, so that would be cool. Uh, it is believed that there are some animals. Some people say, no, that's not true. Yeah, it is believed that some animals, maybe owls, have a little bit of infrared that their retina can pick up just enough so that they can see heat signatures moving. And I believe heat, that. If there's anything weird out there it's an owl he's, he's... oh yeah no kidding <laughs> uh but i don't i think that uh evolutionarily if you want to talk about it from evolution 
yes, it's an adaptation for us to stay alive. Uh, it, it would not be a good thing for us to see the whole spectrum. In fact, we wouldn't be here. We could, we couldn't survive. So yes. So, but I think these things do exist. And I think it is, we are generated from the earth. All right. So we'll start from there. We are plasma forms ourself. We are temporary. We're intrusions of intelligent manifesting energy. And that's what I've called plasmas. They're temporary intrusions of intelligent manifesting energy. We are too. It's just, they don't seem to last as long as we do. But from the perspective of billions of years, each one of us is nothing more than, you know, a snap of the fingers. We're a blip. We hardly ever existed at the end. It only seems that way to us. But I think if plasmas, this is what the physicists have said, if you can keep a plasma going long enough, if you can do that, it will have all of the signs of life that we recognize as the signs of life. The ability to reproduce, the ability to evolve, the ability to interact with other life and plasmas already can do that. So I think that's what they are. Natural earth energy. Uh, but when I say natural, so are we. We are natural earth energy. There's nothing unnatural about us. They are the same thing. It's just they're foreign. And I think Native Americans, that's how I got into this. I think Native Americans their shaman knew that that is what their whole philosophy is about and it's harmonizing with this force because if you don't harmonize with it it causes disorder it causes disharmony and that is why they performed a lot of these rituals it was to harmonize with it it's like where i very first started i said you can you can interact with this voluntarily most people do so with not what Native Americans would say was the correct motive. The correct motive is to harmonize with it for the good of all. The incorrect reason to harmonize with it is, I want to find out what the heck it is and can I control it? Uh, that's not, that's not a, necessarily a good reason. As uh, Brad Steiger, who I knew, who's now deceased, Brad Steiger said, people want the secrets of the universe just handed to them. And he said, but they can't balance their own checkbook. So in order to do this, to interact with this stuff, you have to have your feet on the ground. You have to have a balanced life to interact with it. You just can't totally immerse yourself in it or you will go into disharmony and chaos. And that's what Native Americans knew. And they called that tricksters. When you're starting in to interact with it, you will encounter a trickster and you will be misled. Which yeah. Sadly, yeah. Okay. I, mean, I was going to do. No, no, no. I, I, uh, I agree with that actually. And I think that there's a lot of woo merchants out there, um, whether they're accumulating followers or whatever, they don't do real research. They just retweet whatever sounds crazy or cool or whatever. Um, but people are, they gravitate towards that for whatever reason. We want the sensational. We want the sexy. We want, you know, the, the thing that's going to tell us we're going to live forever or we're given secrets of the universe or people just want that. But yes, the path of truth or the path of knowledge is a long, hard path that nothing's given, but yeah. everything can be earned. Um, but to, to let's get over, cause I know Shane had those questions. If you want to yeah, answer those I, questions. I remember it. Okay. okay. So, so somebody brought up the, the uh, big horn medicine wheel. Uh, the medicine wheel was used in ceremonies and they were ceremonies to contact this other force, uh, this, the, the, whatever you want to call this other force. Uh, and the Native Americans did teach and believe that there are several levels to this force. And the first one is almost always a trickster and you have to get by the trickster to get to the more powerful forces. So the Bighorn Medicine Wheels in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming, it's at the 10,000 foot level. It's above the timberline. Uh, it is 80, it's an 80 foot ring of stones and the diameter is 80 feet. It has 28 stone spokes coming out from the center. So it's a, a big pile of stones in a circle. Uh, then there are like spokes of piled stones. There are cairns, C-A-I-R-N-S. A, a, a cairn is a, uh, a pile of stones that has a depressed center. There's one right in the exact center of the wheel. So on certain mornings and nights of the year, 
a person could go to that center and uh, recline themselves and look down a spoke. And because it's at the 10,000 foot level, you get an incredible view of the horizon. There was a ceremony that the Cheyenne tribe did. That's how we know this. Uh, we know from the Cheyenne tribe how this was used. So there was a ceremony called the Massam Ceremony. It was done in the middle of the summer and it lasted 56 days. Uh, the first 28 days were preparation. The last 28 days were the actual ceremony. Uh, the shaman would send watchers to the bighorn medicine wheel and they would look down one spoke and what they would look for is right before the sun came up, right before it came up, they would look down one of the spokes and look for a star that would appear, the red star that it would appear right above the horizon, right when the sun came up and blot out the rest of the stars. Uh, that star was Rigel of uh, Orion. So that meant that God was summoning them. God was called Maheo. And so they immediately sent out word, okay, God has sent us the signal. Maheo has sent the signal. They would gather at a couple of places. This was done several different places. One of the things that they did was they would, on the ground, they would create this sacred circle. Uh, they would pile some earth up around. It was a pretty big circle. And then they would remove the sod, take the sod off to expose the dirt. And the people that would go into this circle would take off whatever they were wearing on their feet and they would ground, ground their feet into the sod, almost like electrical grounding. That was part of the ceremony. The reason that you have the outer wall of earth, it didn't have to be very high, but that was to contain the spiritual entities that you were going to manifest in this circle. So that is one of the ceremonies. Uh, and that one was open up pretty much to everybody. Another of the ceremonies that was closed to almost everybody, but the most elite of the shaman and the medicine people was the uh, replication of the beginning. And the beginning was when a singularity of energy thought outward and created the universe. And when it did, when this singularity of energy thought outward, it created three worlds, an upper world, which was really just a force, a lower world, which was a force, and the middle world, which was earth, the physical earth. And earth, earth is the interaction sphere. This is what they believe. This is why I've said that we're dealing with a natural earth energy here. Earth and the physical world is the interaction space between the two forces of the universe, the yin and yang of the universe. It is the force of creation and the force of entropy or disharmony or chaos. So you have creation and entropy. So when as soon as things are created, entropy, which is a physics term, science term, Entropy starts degrading it and whatever you create eventually falls apart and then creation puts it back together into something else. So humans were tasked to come into this physical world and create harmony and harmonize with these two forces. That's why they held these rituals. So they believed they had to hold this ritual. So there were, uh, so they would hold the rituals at the end of it, there were three different stars they looked at at three points. The first one said prepare. The second one was when they were supposed to begin it. That was the star Aldebaran, which is also part of, of uh, Orion. And the third one that ended it after 56 days. There was a covenant between God and the tribe or us. The covenant had to do with harmony. You have, you have ensured that harmony will occur for another year. And the covenant was sealed when they would look down another one of the spokes at the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, and they would see the white star rise. And the white star was serious. It would rise right above the horizon, right before the sun came up. So that's how it's believed. That's how all of the medicine wheels were used. Uh, Canada has, I believe, about a dozen of them. 
Uh, there are several in the United States. Most of the ones here have been vandalized, uh, destroyed or partly destroyed. Uh, there's actually one in um, Arizona, which is on a mountain that has been, the stones have been moved so much, it, it makes next, next to no sense anymore. But that's the story of the medicine well. There is a story of, um, they called him long hair. It was Red Plume. Uh, and Red Plume, the story of him is very famous. And he went there for three days. Well, he wound up spending four days and three nights at the Bighorn Medicine Wheel doing the adolescent vision quest, which when, when you turn at roughly age 12, you're supposed to go out alone somewhere to a sacred site for three days and three nights without any food, without any comfort. Uh, he had nothing but a buffalo robe, and he didn't drink anything or eat anything. So the first three nights, he just suffered through the cold. I mean, it is cold up there, even in the even in the summer. It's cold at the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. Now, I've been there. I was there in the in the middle of the summer, and it was almost freezing when we were up there at ten thousand feet. <clears throat> but he went there, and on the third night, when he was suffering, he he heard footsteps coming. And he saw three little beings, which he called the little people. They were about three and a half feet tall, almost indistinguishable from what we would say is a gray today. Uh, and a an opening occurred under the central cairn where he was, because the three beings came in. There are a few words that they said. I won't. I don't have the time to get into that. But they went down into a cave system, and he supposedly was in that cave system for three more days. When he came out, his initial name, uh, the tribal name was Fool Boy. When he came out, they gave him a red eagle feather and told him to wear this. And his new name was to be Red Plume. When he went back to the village, half the people believed him and the other half scoffed at him because he apparently was a braggart. There's a lot written about him as Fool Boy. Uh, but then he led his people out on a number of raids. He, uh, big deal with them. He got some scalps. Uh, this was in the very early uh, 1800s when this occurred. Uh, he got some scalps and horses, uh, and he was a signer of a peace treaty. Uh, he had several miraculous things that occurred, um, and his hair got 20-some feet long. Uh, the whites called him long hair, and some of that hair is in a state park uh, in Wyoming. Uh, Chief Plenty, uh, it's called Chief Plenty Hawks uh, or Plenty something state park uh, where his hair is. So that's another story. But there's a lot of stories. And he was buried up there uh, at the Bighorn Medicine. Where there's a lot of stories about it. That's just. <clears throat> do you couple. do like tours? You should think about taking people. I used people. to. I, say, I used should... to. And uh, here's the thing. Remember, we started out. I decided to come up with these books. Um uh, uh, I used to do tours. I'm being asked to do them all the time. I did them with the ARE, the, the Agri case. I mean, I just see what's going on out in the landscape right now in these Egypt and yeah. all these different tours are just blowing yeah. up. People are, you know, going well, gaga I saw over. A thing, I, one of the things that I have seen, and some people have said that, I've said it on a lot of shows. Uh, Egypt, for example, Egypt is great. I've been there, got sick there. My wife got sick there. Almost everybody, you spend enough time there, you'll get ill. Uh, but anyway, we went into Great Pyramid. We did all the stuff, you know, that they, oh, it's a, it's a privilege to go into the, you know, have private time in the Great Pyramid. Almost every tour group does. Uh, it's a privilege to get in the Sphinx enclosure. Almost every tour group does. We did all that. Uh, we got to see the opening at the back of the pyramid of the, the Sphinx and so on. Uh, we got to meet Zahi Hawass and all that. But anyway, it's great. Egypt is fantastic. Okay, so the oldest site in in all of Egypt that is known is mounds. The Egypt started with mounds. The oldest mound in Egypt dates to a little under 5,000 BC. It's like 4,500 BC. We're talking mastabas or what are we talking? No, here? mounds. Mounds, the, the, okay. the oldest pyramid dates to 2,800. According to mainstream Egyptian belief, the oldest pyramid in Egypt, the actual pyramid, dates to about 2,800 BC. So That's the thing, the thing right, I so get confused... All right. In America, we have yeah. a, we have a hundred thousand mounds. One of which is almost as big as the its its base is an acre bigger than the Great Pyramid. There's a hundred and twenty mounds at Cahokia, and all of all of Egypt has like a hundred and six or a hundred and eight pyramids. 
and it's not as old as the civilizations here. South America has mounds dating to 8400 BC, and South America has more stone structures. I mean, all the stone structures in Egypt would probably fit in one city in South America, one of the, one of the ancient cities there. Well, there's 100,000 mounds in North America, and the oldest mound in North America now dates to 9,000 BC, 11,000 years old. Nothing in Egypt dates to that. Now, I suspect there were people there in Egypt, but there's no remnants of them from them. So things here, America and South America and Central America, my God, man, the mounds are incredible. The museums that show the things from the mounds uh, are incredible. It's just unreal. And people don't realize what it's like. Go to Newark, Ohio, folks. Go to Cahokia, Illinois. Go to Poverty Point, Louisiana. There are loads of others I could name. They're incredible. They're mind-blowing. Now, Egypt's mind-blowing too. But again, it's not as old and there's not as much there. It's, it's really that simple. There was more gold taken in, in Central and South America than all of Egypt. Of course, a lot of the Egyptian stuff was found intact. But the, the Spanish Empire, the British Empire, Portugal, France, they were sustained by all the gold that was plundered out of South America. And even, even into the 1900s and the 2000s and some of those enormous pyramids in South America. I mean, enormous. They look like a mountain there. Some of those still have it in them and they've been pulling gold. Yeah, what, you say the oldest out. ones like from Bolivia or in Bolivia? The oldest one in North in the, in, in the world right now is in Louisiana on the campus of Louisiana State University. Oh yeah, that's right. They haven't dug I, it up. I, or, taught, I, yeah. I taught at LSU for three years. Uh, And I saw those many times. They now have a fence around them. Students used to drive over them and drink beer on them and so on. Uh, It's a football school, obviously. Uh, And when a student, a a Jeep went careening over it and ran into some students and killed one, that's when they decided they need to put a fence around it. Uh, But last year, it was finally, that one was finally carbon dated to 9,000 BC. There are many others in Louisiana that are carbon dated to almost 5,000 BC. That's been known for a long time. So there's a lot that are dated to 5,000 BC uh, and a lot dated to 4,500 and 4,000 BC. So you're mentioning- All of it's older than Egypt. Sorry, yeah, but you're, me- you're mentioning the mounds in Egypt. I, I, there's mounds in Europe. Um, yes. Where, what, so what's up with those mounds? Because obviously those aren't, were those bronze, part of, go ahead. Most of those are Bronze Age. I've posted some pictures of the ones uh, like in- Sweden like and, and yeah, what's that England? one that they found in England? The lady's property, and they turned it into a movie, and it was a king's ship, Viking yeah. burial. Um, but again, those those aren't gone way, way, way back. Although no, I know. Are, I'm saying, do you think that yeah. the, they got the idea from reaching the Americas or something like that? No. Now, I I think this was a, I think it was a worldwide phenomenon, but I think that it, a lot of this information. Now, I'm on the Graham Hancock thing, and it's not that Graham is the first person who's ever come up with this, you know, lost civilization and so on. Robert Schock is one. I've said it for decades. Our books on our early books uh, talked about this in Atlantis, but we weren't the first. There's a lot of people that have talked about it. I think there was a maritime culture that that ended. I don't know when it started, but it ended around 10,000 B.C. Uh, Edgar Casey said it went back to 200,000, that it began in 200,000 BC. Uh, and whether or not that's true, I don't know. But I posted some, some material yesterday on Twitter about a site in Mexi- near Mexico City that is reliably dated to 250,000 years ago, at least. And who did the dating? The United States Geological Survey did the initial dating. It was followed up by laboratories and universities in France and England and Germany. And in 2000, that, that was all found in the 1980s. North American Archaeologists. Well, there's that site. Uh, 
there's that site in Mexico too. It's like a cave in Chiquahita. I think it's 30,000 years old too. And they found like 300 stone tools that are now, they're catching heat from other people trying to say that that's chipping from rocks falling and creating the illusion of them being. It's it's like, how did it get in the sediment? You know, like. So you're reading what what we read here is the English stuff, and we're dominated by the by the American archaeologists. South American archaeology takes a completely different view of all this, and they accept a lot of it. And they say they say that well, the, the only quote I'll give you is that North American archaeologists have always said we were first because all of the people that entered America came in around 9600 BC across Beringia, and that was Clovis first. They said that's where it started. But it's pretty reliable now. There's two, two, two sites in South America that date to 250,000 years ago. And I think those are the remnants of whatever this maritime culture was that went all over the world. The, the Earth's seas, the sea levels were much lower then. People don't know this, but when the sea levels are lower, the seas are much more stable and your weather is much more stable. The colder it is, the more stable your weather is. The warmer it is, it's the exact opposite. But when the sea levels were lower, it it probably was much easier to sail around the world. So I'm I'm on the same wavelength that Graham Hancock is on with this and Robert Schock and many, many others. There was an ancient maritime culture. It it traveled all over the world, traveled all over the world, and whatever happened in 10,000 BC that caused the Younger Dryas event, whatever happened then, it pretty much destroyed it because they their ports were where ports are. Their ports were along the oceans and on the islands. And all of that got destroyed. And I think actually the remnants of one of it, I have said this before, I don't think I ever said it in your show. Uh, we put some video out on it and some film. We're gonna do more on that soon. I think some of the remnants of that have been found at the 10,000 BC shoreline in the Bahamas, about five miles off of the coast of Bimini. There is a long line of structures sitting right on the shoreline. You can actually see the 10,000 BC shoreline when you dive there. And I know that's what it is because the university... Uh, yeah, the, the University of Florida's underwater archaeology department are the ones who discovered that shoreline and have actually mapped it out. But there's a set of structures. There's like 75 square and rectangular structures there covered with coral uh, that look like buildings that have collapsed in straight lines, three rows of them in straight lines. We did a show on that on uh, the History Channel back several years ago. They have re-released that show a few times. Uh, and even their, their professionals that they took with us, they had a guy who, who does uh, professional photography underwater all over the world. And he had a device where, man, he could fly through the water. And he went up and down this, this row of these structures, which the row is about a mile and a half long. Because like I said, there's, we counted 75 of them on side scan sonar. And he said he'd been all over the world. He'd never seen anything like it, ever. Never. He said, I, I, I have no idea what it is. Well, we got to dive it and touch it. And they look like they were buildings, the foundations of buildings. And of course, the roofs would be perishable, which means everything is perishable, but it means they collapsed. And then they filled with sand over time. That's what it looks like. And there's some stuff growing in the sand, uh, but they're all about 10, some of them are 20 feet by 10 feet. Most of them are like 10 by 12 size. Uh, And what they look like to us is they are structures that were used to move and store cargo along a shoreline. That's what we believe they are. And then if you get closer to Bimini, you see stuff that's even more recent. Till you get right up to where the sea levels were about a thousand years ago. And what you see there are giant stone circles. There's there's a row of five stone circles that you never see on documentaries. Could it be something like uh, the cart ruts on Malta? Kind of like you're talking about like on the edge of probably some sort of well, shipping. We didn't, see any, 
we didn't see no but in the in the sense that like something on the edge of the you know some ancient way of transporting things on and offshore or something like that these are literally square and rectangular structures that are some of them are about six to eight feet high uh very uniform there's outer wall it's all covered with yeah floor, we talked so i mean we you showed us yeah. all the pictures we used them uh if anybody's oh, really? interested I showed those. yeah okay. you sent them to us and we made some clips too a while back um you sent us your scuba photos from bimini oh, yeah. remember okay. we did that whole episode on like edgar casey oh, yeah, and atlantis yeah, yeah. and all that okay. so yeah if anybody's interested you can go watch that episode we used some of his real pictures and the clips and stuff like that too yeah we're all over the place here but that that fits into this globe that's why i think the mounds are everywhere i just think there was a transfer of information everywhere and yeah people moved around a lot there's a lot of so do do you think it gives merit then to the idea and i i know the people that love the mystery and the mysticism won't like this but this idea of you have mounds you have people making mounds all over the world that maybe just don't have contact or maybe they did whatever then you have pyramids. Pyramids are found all over the world. People would argue, oh, well, how did they know to all make pyramids? You know, same concept for the mounds. So you start with mounds and then it turns into pyramids. Is there is that some sort of, you know, line of progression happening there, do you think? Or do you think it, it's more complicated? It, appear, than that? it appears that, well, I, I don't think it's that complicated much more than that. I will say this, that there is evidence that the, the North American natives uh decided that they weren't going to use stone there are a couple of giant mounds miamisburg ohio's one it's a very monstrous huge conical mound 65 feet tall and it looks it from a distance it looks like a pyramid it was originally covered in stone slabs and all the stone slabs were stolen uh, or taken by the locals when they came in to use as building material because it was so handy. And then later they discovered, well, inside of this, about three feet down, there's another whole layer of the stone slabs. Uh, so it has that. And a lot of mounds in America have stone structures in them. Many, many do. And some of those stone structures look like mini pyramids. But, okay, I believe the Native Americans deliberately chose not to build out of stone. They had a different philosophy. Um, and the, there's, a, there's a different type of elite ruling belief system, I think, that takes place when you start forcing the populace to build pyramids and these enormous megalithic structures that people did pretty much willingly, but society had to support that. Uh, and they weren't harmonizing. They, the, the, the Northern Native Americans, the ones that were in America, were trying to harmonize with the forces. And something else happened. And there's some evidence that they made a conscious decision to not take it to the next step, which would be the pyramid building. So, yeah, I think somewhat it's a natural progression. But the, the Romans were, were putting these giant mounds uh, in England around the year 100 to 400 BC. I posted a few pictures of those we went to and there yeah, are. Yeah, we did. It, it, yeah. I, I made a video on like the Greek pyramids too. Like there's one in Hellenicon and um, a couple other places. But um, yeah, I don't know that that whole thing. I, I, I wonder about that though, like the line of, cause human beings really aren't that uh, innovative. Like we just repeat you know respout recopy we all you know we're we're basically biological ai um well that's that's true that's a good way i've never heard anybody say that but you're dead right but so that being said um i find it hard to believe um that these were completely original ideas in the sense that maybe it, it was something functional or something. I don't know. I just feel like there's a little bit more to it. Maybe not as simple as yeah. the academic dogmatic people say it's, Oh, it's just a line of progression and uniformitarianism. And then the other people are saying, no dude, they, you know, they harness, they rode the lightning bro. And, you know, I think it's somewhere in between both of those perspectives. That's you know? what I'm saying. They, yeah. they were connecting with this other force and this other force is foreign to some people i have written in other books none of which we've talked about because they're they're pretty old books now that i believe that uh skeptics lack a very specific mineral in the brain 
uh, because they don't have experiences and they don't believe in anything. And I've said it's the mineral magnetite. Magnetite was discovered in the human brain in 1992. That was when the very first report came out. And then in 1992, I picked up on that right away because I've always wondered. They've always said, well, electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields have no way to influence brain processes. That was what was in the textbooks in the 1990s. Well, magnetite, what they didn't realize that there were literally magnetite crystals in the brain. The first place they found them was in the hippocampus and they literally were like shards of magnetite. Now, I mean, you know, it's big. We're talking about microscopic here. And if you know anything about magnetite, when you get magnetite in a, in a magnetic field, it aligns itself. It has a north and a south pole and it, it aligns itself in a magnetic field. And they've known for a long time that that's how pigeons navigate by using magnetite in the brain. And I, ha I have believed pretty firmly since then that the amount of magnetite people may have in their brain and maybe other unknown substances that have yet to be uh, identified there, that may account for why some people have many experiences and why some have none and can't imagine why people would have them other than them just hallucinating or being kind of crazy off the deep end. I think you're muted, Mike. Yeah, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oh, okay, muted. good. I was like, I, uh, am I, I am muted. Again? <laughs> uh, again, well, everybody stopped talking, so I didn't. Uh, no, so that would make sense, actually, the magnetite thing in the sense that, uh, you know, people have serotonin deficiencies or they have um you know endogenous chemical issues in their brain or whatever the case may be where people are taking all sorts of things daily to try and make themselves the best version of themselves so if you were to find out you know maybe you don't have enough magnetite in your brain you know why would you be able to possibly take a well, supplement some, you know some might have too much and they have yeah. i've seen people that are haunted by experiences all the time and they say it's very real this is very, very real. I, and if you've worked with schizophrenics, I worked for five years in a mental health unit in a prison. And in that mental health unit, we had schizophr criminal schizophrenics. They weren't locked up because they were schizophrenics. They were locked up because they stole cars and they did burglaries and they did other, or they were violent to people. And it wasn't because of the schizophrenia. So they, they, you know, the, the, if you're around them enough and you talk to them enough, they're telling you that they hear things that are very real and that they see things that they believe are very real, that look solid to them and they interact with. And you do it enough and it gets spooky. And a lot of people, there is a theory, some people believe that what they are interacting with are entities that are there in the electromagnetic energy spectrum uh, and the entities are kind of drawn to them because they know they can interact with them, whereas they're not drawn to us because we don't. So it may very well be that maybe, maybe it's a, a crazy theory I have thought of, never published it. Maybe schizophrenics have too much of a certain kind of mineral within their brain that makes them very susceptible to certain electromagnetic fields. Now, and I, know, I, have I said, know a couple people with it. Um <laughs> The research I've been interested, obviously, can psychedelics help? Does it hurt? We know that it can induce it um, if you're borderline already. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's obviously an issue. That's why you should be careful. Always talk with a doctor or whatever. In some states, it's decriminalized. So, you know, you, yeah. you really have to do your homework. Um, but that aside, one of the two interesting things that I saw, one was the gut biome and how that affects your brain. We know 70, roughly 75, 80% of your serotonin is contained within your gut. So if you have poor yeah. gut biome and a poor system down there, you, you got to, you know, I think of, you know, I have had family members that have had mental health issues living on the streets. Shane uh, was a, an addict living on the streets of Washington at one point when he got out of the military. So, um, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but I, I you know, there, that was the one theory. Um, and then another theory I've heard is, so the voices that you hear, there's some issue with inner, their inner monologue or homunculus or whatever, where how, when you're talking to yourself, you know how you hear your inner voice or whatever, mm -hmm. 
to them, that's another person or that's a foreign ent- for them. They can't distinguish that as your inner monologue. They think that that's a separate entity completely. So that I thought that that was kind of an interesting psychological yeah, approach. I, to- yeah. I've, I have heard that many times. I know that that occurs. Uh, there is, um, there are many though that hear the words just like they're hearing me and you right now. Uh, and they, they just swear up and down. That's what it is. And there's no reason for these people to, So you mean like serious uh, auditory hallucinations? Yeah. Audit- right. Auditory hallucinations are the most common visual hallucinations are actually pretty rare, but auditory is very common. Uh, and I do think a lot of it is that with some of them, their inner voice, uh, becomes repetitive. They perseverate on it. Uh, and they think about it over and over and over. There is some of that, but a lot of them hear what they say are actual voices. Uh, and like I say, I, th- some of them are very convincing with that. And I'm not saying they're telling me they're sitting there and trying to convince me for any reason other than just talking to me because there's nothing I could do for them. Uh, we, we're just talking. I say, no, it sounds just like you're talking to me here now. Do you hear it now? No, I don't hear it right now. But I will, I may hear it later. It comes and goes. That's the kind of thing they'd say. But not all of them. Some have that inner voice thing. Some of them confuse the inner voice that, you know, that whispers to us. Uh, we, we call it a whisper, but it's all mental. Uh, some of them confuse that too. But I've, many of them say it's just like a voice. So it's possible. Uh, years ago, not many years ago, people would have thought that gut biome was complete nonsense. That would have been considered utter, total nonsense, just like the idea of magnetite being in the human brain was complete nonsense before 1992. Uh, A lot of what we've talked about would be considered nonsense. Archaeology says that there are mounds around the world only because uh, every society came up with them on their own. I think that is kind of ridiculous. They say any other ideas are nonsense. Uh, they used to say, and up until 1997, they said there was nobody in the Americas, probably until 9600 BC. Uh, in, in the 1970s, they said it's absolute fact that nobody was in the Americas until Clovis came in in 9600 BC. And we know all these facts that we are given are not true. Lots of the facts that I learned in, in high school and elementary school and in college and in graduate school, they're all wrong. A lot of the things that I learned that were that we were told are absolute facts. That's because there's no, there's no such thing as a fact. Yes, absolutely. Huh. It it changes quickly. A lot of ideas that were considered preposterous just a few years ago are now mainstream. We accept them. Uh, so. Yeah, I I don't think there's any, I mean, having mainstream physicists come out and say that plasmas are alive, plasmas have intelligence and we can interact with them and that they can reproduce. And if they had enough energy, they would, they could, uh, they could probably form into what we would call an actual life form. And a lot of people say, yeah, well, they need enough energy. Well, if you don't have energy, you're not going to stay around very long either. I mean, it's the same thing as with us. You just got to look at it like, it's just a different form. It's a different life form, but it's alien to us. And what is its motive? What is, what is the motive of all this? I think the motive is beyond our comprehension. And I think it literally is the best thing to do is to try and harmonize with it. If you try and control it, you won't. You're, you're going to get into this entropy and chaos, but you harmonize with it. That's like That's it. everybody's wondering where the aliens are. They're living in our guts, telling us to eat sugar. <laughs> I mean, that's seriously like. <laughs> well, you're in a way you're absolutely correct. They're taking us out systematically, slowly. You know, it's uh, so no, but um, I, you know, we live in a weird world, and the fact that we're even having this conversation through this technology, and um, you know, we're weirdos for talking about this stuff too. You know, you absolutely. talk about this stuff, r- regular people, they're like, "What the hell are you talking about?" Um, my, my dad who died just a couple years ago was, uh, died at age 96. I mean, he, he saw that he was around, uh, he was born in 1925. Uh, and so he saw the early planes. He became a pilot. He was in world war two, but he grew up in on a farm that had no electricity, 
no running water. They had to go to a pump and an outhouse. And that was just, that's just one generation ago. That's the thing we have to remember. Uh, and his, his dad was the same way. My dad actually spent his youth going to a railroad track and he helped dump the water into a railroad train, uh, into the, into the, uh, boiler of a steam engine on a railroad. That's what he did, uh, up until he was around age 10 or so. He helped his slightly, his brother that was one year older do that. And it's amazing. It's just one generation. And when I was a kid, we had a party line as a telephone and it rang. It had several different rings. If it rang one way, it was for a neighbor. If it rang a different way, it was for a different neighbor. And if it rang the third way, it was for us. And you'd get on and you'd hear the neighbors listening sometimes. And, and, and my life, that was my life. And that wasn't that, you know, it's, it's not that long ago. So who knows in one more generation what's going to be. But cell phones, I asked my dad about the technology. My father, when he got out of the Navy, wound up working for NASA. Uh, we moved to Huntsville, Alabama when I was uh, 11 years old. And uh, he worked on the Gemini project. Uh, and everything then was, was wires. He worked on wiring the uh, communication system for the Gemini capsules. Uh, and he would talk about this stuff. Uh, we went down to Huntsville where they have some of the capsules and looked at the wiring and it's a giant bundle. And he worked on a way to communicate with them. I think I told you this for when the first ships, when, when the first ships would wind up, uh, the capsules would wind up on the moon. What if all the communication system broke down and he worked on a system uh, using light beams to go from Cape Canaveral to the moon? to communicate through bursts of light. Uh, and I suppose, and that actually was about as high tech as it got then. Just one generation. And even my, me, I, I've seen, it, it's amazing what's happened. I couldn't have imagined cell phones. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, this and is a where computer. it gets, yeah. it's a computer. And this is where it gets weird because when you think about like ancient people and what they actually knew, we base it on like their clothes and, did they have computers and things like that? Um, but what you're talking about is pretty, we can either go two ways on that, right? We can say, okay, it was kind of a certain way for a very long time until we have this paradigm shift about technology and now everything's going to go exponentially. That could be the case, but it also could be the case that maybe the ancient people had knowledge of earth and earth energies and things that we're just not aware of. It's a technology, but a natural technology or a more organic technology. Um, and that those people knew things that were wild beyond what we can know. Cause we're so, you know, I, I think that's kind of what we're t taking away from this whole conversation here is that, you know, these ancient people had their own ways and understandings of doing things. But it's like, if you believe in evolution, either our brains have gotten dramatic, we've become dramatically smarter over the last 50 years, like crazy, like even bigger than when our brain size doubled or tripled or whatever, because the way that we're able to affect our environment now is so far beyond what we were even able to do a couple hundred years ago. It's crazy. So, I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're any smarter. Uh, I think the ancients were pretty much as smart uh, as any of us are. Uh, they had a little more into survival. And remember, they went through like the younger Dryas. They went through natural disasters. And that's kind of like talking about the collapse of history and what could happen. Uh, we are in the process. We're in a process of something, a transition right now where we could see the collapse of cities. We could see cities being gutted. You know, people, what remains of that ancient world is stone. Uh, that, that's mainly what we see. And then any artifacts that happen to be saved because they were buried in a tomb within a mound or something, that's, that's what we tend to, to find. Uh, but we don't find anything else. But I've, I've told you before, we found a bunch of planes in the Bahamas that had only been in the water for 30 or 40 years, and they're indistinguishable. Uh, after a couple hundred years, whatever they are, it's gone. You can't, you're not going to see any of it. And I'll never forget interviewing Edgar Evans Casey back a few years ago before he died. Uh, I believe he was 98 when he died. But we enter, Edgar Evans was Edgar Casey's grandson, and he wrote a book called Edgar, Casey's, uh, Edgar Casey on Atlantis, which 
which skeptics analyzed as if it was Edgar Casey himself wrote the book, and they, they couldn't believe that it was his grandson. That's another story. But anyway, Edgar Evans told us, uh, and I had never thought about it. He said, the more advanced the civilization is, the easier it is to destroy its remnants. The more advanced it is, the easier it is to destroy its remnants. Uh, and I saw an interesting post. Uh, I'd never read this either. Uh, it was on Twitter today. Some guy in his byline on Twitter, his description, he said, the cloud is simply your data on somebody else's computer. Lots of people, when they talk about the cloud, they think the cloud is literally something, you know, that, that it's, oh, it's floating around in the ether. You know, they're sending electromagnetic waves out in the ether and it's stored. No, it, your data is simply on somebody else's computer. That's the cloud. Uh, and people say, how many times have people had to rebuy uh, maybe Microsoft Word? or some other program, every time their computer gets zapped, they oh, buy yeah. it. And, and how many times do they lose music? How many photos are gone? Well, that's uh, like I have Apple, okay, I use MacBook Pro. I use yeah. Logic Pro for music and editing and everything. I can't transfer, because I used a different Apple ID, I have to then yeah. buy it again. They won't just transfer it to my other, it's like stuff like that, it's like, what are we doing? Yeah, well, it's all, it gets gone, and it's not forever. Uh, everything we know, you know, they say we got to digitize everything to save it. Well, digital stuff is the easiest stuff to destroy. I mean, it's uh, I was I was shocked when somebody uh, we have we have CDs that we have old books on from like twenty twenty five years ago uh, when we very first started uh, using computers with all this. Uh, and CDs don't last indefinitely. They start they start breaking up, and you start losing data. And then read about uh, thumb drives. Well, thumb drives have a less of a lifespan than CDs. Uh, you need to keep backing that up. Hard drives probably last a little longer, but they get zapped too. So uh, they say that digitizing everything is going to save it. No, it didn't. Uh, it's it's the easiest stuff to destroy. All this metal, all these buildings we build. You see this show, After Earth. It's a great show. It says what had happened. Oh, yeah. People were suddenly gone. Yep. It'll all be gone. All you know what buildings. takes over, right? Do you remember the last episode? I don't remember, but I, other than animals. Oh, no, I'm getting confused. Okay, so there's two shows. There's one that yeah. you're talking about, which shows like three 300 years from now, the, yeah. the skyscrapers old. But there yeah, used to be one. And- Yep. There used to be one where it would show the evolution, the further evolution of animals based on ecosystems. Oh, I yeah, think it was on yeah. Animal Planet. And when we will leave the planet, I forget where it says what, by what year. But then guess what will become the most sentient, uh, you know, organism on Earth? What? What will it be? Squid. Ah. Well, thank God they can't walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these ones did. So. Well, they can walk on the bottom. Yeah. That's right. But I, I suspect they would adapt to yeah. uh, breathe air. That's what yeah. I would suspect. But yeah, uh, it, it, we're not. It's not permanent. Nothing is really permanent. Um, I think somewhere. So we don't really know what they had. That's the thing. We don't know what they had twenty thousand years ago. We don't really know what was in Gobekli Tepe other than all the stone that's been found in the skulls. That's it. Who knows what they had? Oh, we know what what they had, bro. They had drugs. No, I'm joking. Uh, well, we know <laughs> that. Yes, you're right. They had that. But we um, don't know what else they, we don't know what they're, you know, I hate to use the word technology because people immediately think, oh, planes and spaceships and, and computers and cell phones. I don't know if they had that. No, they certainly they, had I don't a way think to communicate. They, they communicated. Oh. They had a way to transfer information from one person to another. Native Americans. Can you imagine a dude? Language. Can you imagine a dude on a cell phone? Hey, I need another. I need you to cut another clay block, bro, or <laughs> limestone block. Come on, we need it over here by sunset. Um, yeah. But uh, let's start to wrap it up. Listen, we did All not right. talk about entheogens, and I did want to talk about that. But I have a better idea. What if we get you back on sometime in the future with PD? And we do right. a kind of a, a back and forth about all this with the Native American entheogen stuff. Because I know he's been really into it a lot lately, too. So Yeah, I interact quite a lot with him now. He's he's finishing up on a book, and uh, we've interacted quite a lot. So, yeah, great guy. Uh, be glad to. Uh, it's been a pleasure, again. You guys are always great. Uh, sorry Maurice is not here. And Shane, good to meet you here. 
I do remember seeing you on that documentary, though. Um, it was great to meet you. It was great to share the documentary with you, too. It was like, this is so cool, right behind him, too. Well, that that's neat. And Maurice, been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Maurice did want to be on this episode. His girlfriend's in ah, town. He's got some purple Mike, I'm sorry. personal stuff. No, no, you're, oh, you're fine. No, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Mike Don't worry. Maurice, about it. it's always was. Okay. Um, yeah. Just call me Mind Escape. That's what uh, people call uh, me. Mike. Uh, um, Emmy. Yeah, there you go. Um, but no, seriously, dude, I'm not just trying to say this, but, um, I know you always say, oh, this person, that person. you're, I think you're, in my opinion, the top fringe researcher for a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but my, my mind's been changing, you know, you, there's a couple people. I like what Randall does. I like what a few other people do, but, um, you know, there's, there's definitely, um, I don't know how to say that. Uh, whatever. We'll get into it in the future. But basically, I think you're the top dog when it comes to this stuff. You're so open-minded. Um, you've gone to so many of these sites. You've boots on the ground. Um, you're very, very knowledgeable on top of understanding the mind and possibly blind spots that other people might not think of, stuff like that. Um, and then on top of all that, I mean, if you're – reading America before you should read Den Denise of in origins. Uh, if you haven't read it already, um, I think it's the, actually a lot more detailed, uh, in the native American mound stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, I appreciate your native American mound research stuff. And, uh, like I said, I know, you know, you don't talk about it much, but you know, in the future, maybe we we'll get you back on and talk about some of the psychedelic stuff and the native American stuff and the effigy pipes and the substances and the rituals yeah. and, and you know, I know you a little bit of the Path of Souls stuff, but we'll we'll maybe dive into it in the future. But yeah, we'll I just it, really man. appreciate what you're doing and look forward, always looking forward to your next book. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it very much. And I, I had to do the Native American stuff. I had no choice. I told you that before. It came from dreams. And uh, when I decided I wasn't going to do it, I had more dreams and nightmares where I was surrounded by Native Americans yelling at me. And the moment I said, okay, I'll finish it, uh, it's the, those bad dreams stop because I realized it was a lot of work. But anyway, I appreciate your kind words. That is so very nice. Um, it's very humbling. Uh, I think I, I, I would say Graham is, Graham is definitely the top dog. And I appreciate Graham taking the heat from all the skeptics. They focused on him so much. They, pe they let people like me and Andrew Collins and others alone. So that's good. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I and I love what Andrew. I mean, we're gonna have. I think Andrew, but we're still figuring out a date. But we're gonna. Have, he just wrote that book. Um, uh, yeah, first Egypt, female first pharaoh. pharaoh. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we're gonna have him on to discuss that. But um, yeah, no, I really appreciate. Like I said, you're just such a wealth of knowledge on a bunch of different topics. And maybe it's because I'm interested in a lot of the things that you talk about and write about too. But I just really think that your philosophy and philosophy of mind behind the way you look at these things is what separates you from all these other people. So again, I really appreciate That's why I had to have you in the documentary, um, get that plasma yeah. stuff in there. And actually that was a true synchronicity. I just want to point out from earlier, um, Shane, they both submitted separate videos, had nothing to do with each other. And both were talking about the Yakima plasma stuff. And Shane actually has videos of them, which are in the documentary too. So, um, but if you're interested, I have all the link to all of Dr. Gregory's books down below. I highly recommend them. Um, you know, if you know, he covers different topics, philosophy or uh, I'm sorry, uh, psychology, um, Denise of an origins is all about the ancient, you know, native American mound stuff, uh, his more, more recent one origins of the gods, which we just talked about the last episode he was on. Um, you know, that one's Carl Jung and plasmoids and altered states of consciousness and all sorts of wonderful stuff. So again, check out all that stuff. If you haven't already, we've done a bunch of episodes with them. You can check those out. If you're on our Patreon already, um, yeah, please check out, uh, our segments with him. He's done just outstanding work over the years. Um, so this is what I want to do. All the people that have subscribed so far, and I'm sure maybe a couple have rolled in the last couple of days, but I just want to give a shout out to the people that have purchased the documentary uh, on Patreon to watch for 777. Uh, that is Sandy, Zach, Zachariah, Matt, Shambhala, Britta, Blumencraft, T Changed, Chris, Jero, Abraxas, Dawn, Steven, Syed. 
uh, Mush Maps, Christy, Tyler, Ruth, Carol, Ray, Martin, Lisa, Carl, Ryan, Cheng. If I missed anybody, I'll get you next time. But I just really appreciate eating, um, you know, you spending the money and checking out our art and something we put a lot of time into. And um, we put a lot of time into it because it's something we started during, you know, the, sh the shutdowns a few years ago. And it was tough. It's like we can't fly anywhere, do anything. So how can we do this? So we just kind of evolved and shifted and uh, it came together. So uh, you, did. I, you did a great job on that. By the, that was fantastic. I appreciate I it. Was I was really impressed with the visuals on it. I've made some myself and making the visuals fit is one of the hardest things to do. And that's partly why I decided I don't want to do these anymore. It's too much work putting those together, but you did a great, you guys did a great. Well, job. I really People appreciate it. Yeah. It. Yeah. I, I don't know, you know what we're going to do in the future, but obviously documentaries is something we're interested in making more of. Um, and Dr. Greg's in it. Shane's in it. Toby's in it. Um, you know, all the, a lot of the, you know, again, the, the documentary is called as within, so without from UFOs to DMT. So it's kind of a realistic approach to the experience or phenomenon from the lens of both people that have these weird, um, UFO experiences, but then there is some crossover into the realm of people, you know, using DMT and altered states of consciousness and stuff like that. Does that mean anything? Does it not? That's kind of the the idea there but um yeah i just again i appreciate everybody participating everybody checking it out that has checked it out so far and uh yeah uh please again check out dr greg's stuff i really i, I i'm not just saying this he's one of my favorite he's probably top three guests that's that's actually that's that's the truth Thank um I, I, hate to, I, I hate to i hate to throw numbers again. out there i hate to throw numbers out there <laughs> yeah Top three, <laughs> top three. I'm not going to name the other two because I don't want to make people feel weird. But anyway, oh, yeah, hands down, my favorite top guest years. <laughs> my favorite guest years all together. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> uh, well, we've almost done 300 episodes. That's a lot of people. So, again, that's high praise. And, again, I read a fuckload of books. I read a lot of books. <laughs> if you saw my wall right here, you would see it's just books. Um so yeah, all I do is read and I'm a nerd about it. And I can tell you that I, I really highly recommend Dr. Greg's stuff. So again, check out Shane's stuff too. Check out Shane on Twitter at, at, at Old Vet Symposium. Um, more stuff to come. He's working on some article stuff with our buddy Toby from the Roswell Daily Record. Toby uh, has gotten the green light to uh, report a lot of the stuff um, through the Roswell Daily Record having to do with all the recent hearings and ufo stuff and possibly roswell stuff uh so look for that and uh i think that's it we're gonna wrap it up here all the links to everything you want to know about mind escape or support the show or whatever all you have to do is click the link tree link down below and again the the patreon um has our documentary for 777 i'm gonna play the trailer as we leave and um yeah the other best way to support the show is just to uh, leave us a nice review on Apple Podcast and Spotify. We do a video uh, podcast on Spotify. And again, we do all of our shows live on our YouTube channel. So check that out. But we love everybody. Stay safe out there. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace. I don't have to believe something's here. There's no question about that. They are not just from this planet but based on the characteristics they're most often described having, that they're simply us from the future. It was um, the biggest aircraft I've ever seen in my entire life. It was semi-translucent, it seemed. And we see four orange orbs flying one after another, basically in formation. Um, I think in a way, you know, you could call a UFO a flying dream. Out of the cornfield, that seven foot tall, gray, menacing, communion looking alien or whatever you want to call it. Because it can be a multitude of things, of deities, of godlike creatures, of aliens. The reality that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis seems to be this very, very thin slice of, of something far larger and far more complex. As within, so without from UFOs to DMT.
All right. You go there, Shane. You go on. 